So right off the bat, I just want to say that uh, I'm very glad I think it was an unusual talk because it would be a lot of overlap with Brianna. So I'm trying something new and new there today. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy that. Um, so there's no doubt that uh, there's a lot of hype around AI nowadays. It's showing up in the uh, newspapers uh, pretty much on a daily basis if you're paying attention to it. Uh, but there's also a lot of fear and uncertainty around it. Uh, some people will tell you that it's the best thing since uh, ever, really. Uh, it's going to have some, as much impact as the internet, as electricity, depending on who you talk to. Um, others are a little more cautious or optimistic. Uh, pessimistic, sorry. Um, so, um, maybe it's bringing out the demon, or it's going to be the uh, killer robot uh, rising. And this is coming from some very smart people. Uh, but they're not just, they're just not very informed. Um, Gartner, the company that's responsible for the hype cycle, puts machine learning, deep learning, AI, all those technologies are very, very high on the peak. Um, you'll notice that uh, AR and VR are out there as well. Uh, what that means is that there is a gap between what we expect from the technology and what it can actually do. This happens when a few key successes in the industry uh, are making a lot of uh, impact, a lot of uh, excitement, and a lot of people are eager to try it for themselves and get back and get the same kind of results for themselves. That usually gets followed by a period of recalibration and uh, resetting of the expectations uh, before it ultimately leads to a steady state where we can actually drive the right kind of value with the right expectations and the right information around those technologies. Uh, it's estimated that that can take, uh, for AI in particular, uh, another two, or five, two to five years before we actually get and that's assuming we're not heading into another AI winter, if you've heard that before. Uh, there's been initially, uh, AI is not a new thing, we'll talk about it in a moment, but there's been a lot of excitement around AI in the 50s and 60s, and that led to the first AI winter. Again, in the 80s and early 90s, that led to the second AI winter, uh, and now we're seeing it again. Uh, but we think that this is the real thing, so uh, we'll see, we'll find out soon. Um, I'm from Deloitte, so what does a bunch of accountants know about AI? Well, uh, my background is actually machine learning and AI. I did my PhD at the University of Toronto with the uh, machine learning group under the uh, leadership of Jeff Hinton, who's one of the fathers of you know, networks. Um, networks. Um, my career I spent mostly in tech, uh, building AI systems. I've done everything from computational biology to recommendation systems to analytics to processing of scientific literature, uh, and more. I joined Deloitte last year to head their AI uh, initiative. And what I discovered is actually a lot of interest and a lot of knowledge uh, in this subject. They have one of the largest uh, data science teams in, in, um, out of the consulting uh, uh, industry. And we're constantly, constantly talking to our clients in the enterprise uh, about AI. We've discovered that Obviously, tech are very advanced when it comes to AI, and there's a lot of successes there. But the financial industry is uh, very much ahead of the game with respect to uh, all the other industries. And come retail, manufacturing, uh, and uh, public sector and health. And they're facing some real challenges because we're trying to bring AI into systems that are legacy, that are uh, been built around. Uh, dealing with credit cards, and mortgages, and wealth, and they don't like talking to each other because they're all trying to maximize their individual aspect, uh, there are a lot of challenges that come with bringing AI into it. Now, we've been using that term a lot uh, over the last five minutes or so. Um, so let, let's just review a little bit what, what, what is AI and how does it really fit into the industry. Uh, so as I mentioned, AI is not a new thing. The first time it was coined was in the conference in 1956. That's really the start of modern AI or AI. And if you think back to that uh, time, this is where computers were took up uh, entire rooms. Uh, and they could do about as much as your common uh, calculator they can buy today and tell around. Uh, and yet we're already thinking about this. We're already excited about this. If you think back to 2001 in Space Odyssey, that's in the 1960s. Uh, we had that sense of Computers are going to become intelligent. They're going to 
be able to do these things that we can only imagine. Um, as I mentioned, we went through already two uh, winters where people's expectations got reset. Uh, in, in the last five years, roughly, since 2012, we've seen some real advancement, some real uh, successes when it comes to AI. When it comes to things like vision and our ability to parse images, and we saw what Microsoft can do nowadays uh, with modern technology. Uh, when it comes to being able to parse speech and act on it, uh, understand human te te uh, text, human conversations. Uh, but a lot of the exciting things that we hear about are still in the, you know, Peter's now beating the best chess player. Peter's now beating the best go player. Peter's now beating the best poker players. Because these are things that we inherently think of ourselves as being good at. We can look at an image and understand what's in it. We can play these games and until recently we're able to play better than computers. Uh, and the fact that now computers are doing it better than us, uh, a lot of people find disconcerting and they think that robots are coming, uh, Skynet, you know, whatever it is. So, I, 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 I don't think that's the case. So when we talk about AI, Really, what we think, what we talk about are systems that are behaving in an intelligent way. This can be anything as simple as a computer game that plays Pong. Um, this card, at least, uh, I won't get any weird looks because you probably know about Pong. When you played Pong in the 1970s, the computer played against you in an intelligent way. It was completely rule based, but it still made sense within the context of the game. That would be an AI system. Nowadays, when we talk about AI, we mostly talk about systems that are driven by machine learning. What that is, is a set of algorithms, ultimately, that learn from data. We feed a lot of data into it, sometimes a lot, sometimes a lot. Uh, and out comes the set of rules that are going to be used to make the decisions. That can be uh, a decision about a self-driving car, how to play Pong, or which customers to go after in your marketing strategy. In particular, the reason why we're seeing this uh, renewed interest in AI is the field of deep learning. Deep learning is a rebranding of neural networks. And it has allowed us to process this kind of data that we couldn't before at a scale that we couldn't before. Images, sound, video, text. The realm of human interaction and that's what's leading to things like Google Home, Alexa, self-driving car, that are really sparking the imagination of people in the industry uh, to try to go after this. And as Brianna said, there's a going back to traditional methods. When we go and talk to our clients, when we go and talk to our customers, what we ultimately end up using is not necessarily deep learning. It's not the latest and greatest uh, and the most advanced technology. It's actually traditional methods that have existed for 20, 30 years, and we're now driving value from those methods. So as much as deep learning has affected the way we look at AI and how we think about AI, when we look at the value that's being driven in the industry outside tech and consumer products, uh, it's a lot of traditional methods, a lot of traditional methods, machine learning methods. So machine learning, as I said, it's you feed it data, and out come the result. It sounds like magic. People think that AI will be able to do anything we want, but it all comes back to the data. So if I want to train a model, distinguish between cats and dogs, what I need to do is get, get a lot of pictures of cats and a lot of pictures of dogs, and feed it through the model, and now it's going to come and answer. And in the beginning, it's going to make a lot of mistakes. So I'm going to feed it a picture of a, cat, of a dog, it's going to say, no, no, no that's okay. What we're going to do every time it gets, makes a mistake, we're going to slap it on the wrist and we're going to say, no, go and change your mind next time. In the context of neural networks, there's a lot of numerical parameters that come into those networks. We're going to tweak them, we're going to change them, we're going to make them so that next time, instead of a cat, it's going to say, no. We're going to feed it hundreds of thousands or millions of images. And we repeat the process. Every time we make a mistake, we're going to slap it on the wrist and we're going to change something about the network until eventually, it's going to get it right, hopefully every time, but usually uh, most of the time. 
And if that makes sense and that's good enough, then we can now even think of a system. We're going to create seeing AI. We can create translation. We can create all these wonderful things that people are hearing about. So that sounds pretty easy. Uh, why, why is it so hard? Why do we need people like Brianna and like Deloitte to help get this into our customers' hands? Well, first of all, AI itself can be tricky. Uh, it's very easy to make a mistake when you're training models to overestimate the ability of the models to make the right decision at times. Uh, but beyond that, the difficulty lies, as I said, in the data systems. Being able to get all the data that you need at the right moment to make the decision you make you need in real time so that you can make the right decision and take the right action. And that's where we come in. And what we've learned in doing that now over and over again is that, first of all, it's a team sport. So it doesn't, if you as a company want to now do AI, you can't just go and hire a bunch of data scientists, put them in the corner, and tell them, go and do a cool shit. We've tried that. I was one of those geeks in the corner. It doesn't work. You need the organization to get behind the problem that you're trying to solve. You need support from all levels of the organization. Need to get the right people with the right support system uh, in there. Uh, another problem is that data scientists get very bored very quickly and very easily. If you get them to working on the same problems day after day after day, once they feel like they solved them, they're going to want to move on. So you have to always keep them interested. You always have to find new problems for them to solve. But in order to really be able to solve these problems, again, in the context of a business, looking at their marketing strategy, it's looking at their product line. Having the context of what it is that you're trying to solve, what it is that means to put a model in the capital market uh, is absolutely critical. And getting the right data ultimately is the biggest challenge that we've seen in the industry. Luckily, we're in Canada, and Canada is actually one of the leading places for AI. Uh, we've had through luck and our, our divine intervention, uh, three of the top researchers in AI are located in Canada. Uh, that's Jeff Hinton in Toronto, Yoshio Bengio in Montreal, and Rich Sutton in Alberta. And each one of them now has an institute that's built in much around them. We've got Vector here in Toronto, Realign in Montreal, and Amy in Edmonton. And the government has realized that this is something that they want to invest in. We've got the super clusters, a $1 billion investment from the Canadian government in AI across the nation. But it's not enough. We need to make sure that our startup industries and our companies continue to invest in and push this forward. Because if we don't, all we're going to end up doing is training a lot of really good and smart people and then send them south of the border or across the ocean to work on problems for somebody else. So even though when people think about AI, they tend to think about the killer robots, about the self-driving cars, what we see in the industry is that that's just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot, a lot of money to be made by solving more mundane problems with these methods, with these applications. Uh, anything from enhancing the user experience, the customer experience, to making better marketing decisions, to making better decisions about their inventory, uh, if you think of a retailer or a grocery store, being able to predict demand and, and which uh, perishable products to keep on the shelf and which ones not to at any given moment, that can save you millions of dollars and make your business run better. So there's a long tail of problems that are solvable by AI that are, where we actually see the difference and we actually see a lot of movement in the industry. I was going to come initially and talk about all these wonderful things that we and Deloitte have done about AI, but instead what I wanted to give you is a bit of a taste of what AI is, where it is in the hype cycle, and what you can actually do with it, even if your company has nothing to do with AI, even if you don't see a potential uh, use for it, I'm here to tell you that you probably do, uh, and if you get it in and you use it properly, it can make a big difference for your, system, for your uh, Across the industries, no matter where you are, we see that making a difference. Thank you. Any questions? 
questions? Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a question, if I may. Um, there's, uh, Brianna brought it up that one of the ethical issues about AI is about the self driving car. Right? So, God forbid we get into a car accident, human error, right? But in the AI world, I think a computer has to be coded to have a certain ethical guidelines as to when to drive. If, if, if something goes wrong with the brakes, where do we turn? What's our priority? I'd be interested to hear if you think we're headed towards a future where customers choose the car they buy according to what its ethical standard is. Well, that's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> um, the problem with the question, though, is that... <laughs> oh, blame the question. Blame the question. Uh, let me rephrase that. So, the problem is that we're probably not going to make the cars make a decision by coding it, right? As I talked about machine learning, it's about driving the decisions based on the data. Um, so no, there's never going to be some programmer some, sitting somewhere in an office that's going to say, oh, if the brakes fail, I'll go and crash into the guardrail because it's safer. Uh, you know, and then people think, oh, is anybody going to go into a car that you know might kill you in an emergency rather than the, body, than the person next to you? Uh, the way we've, they're approaching right now with things like autonomous driving is they're trying to teach the car to make the decision that the best human drivers would make in that situation by gathering the data from the best human drivers. So when you frame the question around the ethics, it's more about the data that you've collected. And there's, when I think about ethics in AI and machine learning, what comes to my mind is the very recent, uh, for example, uh, with Amazon, the, they trained the machine learning algorithms to pre-filter all the CVs that were coming in. Uh, and then they discovered that it was hugely, hugely biased against any mention of uh, uh, women activity. If, you're, if you had something in your CV around uh, being active in a woman's uh, group or society or whatever, you got downgraded massively. And that's not really the bias in the algorithm. It's not the fault of the machine learning, it's the fault of the data that they fed into it, which is all their historical data around the hiring decision. So what he was saying is, that's how we're practicing what we're making. So coming back to the autonomous driving, I think you should be making the decision of which car to buy based on who had access to the best data on the best drivers in order to drive your algorithms. So you're judging by the history of the development of the product more than the product itself. Yes. All right, very interesting. Okay, good. Wonderful.